Hello, and thank you for joining me today. I've titled today's message, You Want Me to Do What? Because there are times I believe the Spirit is nudging us in directions we may not understand or possibly in a direction we may not really want to go. And truly, I will admit, there are times when I believe what I share with you might just be the Spirit giving me a word of correction because I'm not understanding what he is pushing me toward. But before we dive in, please join me in a prayer for our nation given on September 7th, 1771 by Reverend Jacob Duche at the opening of the First Continental Congress. And I believe we will see a lot of things we need to pray for today. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty King of kings and Lord of lords, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers on earth and resigneth with power supreme and uncontrolled over all the kingdoms, empires, and governments, look down in mercy, we beseech thee, on these our American states, who have fled to thee from the rod of the oppressor and thrown themselves on thy gracious protection, desiring to be henceforth dependent only on thee. To thee have they appealed for the righteousness of their cause. To thee, to thee do they now look up for that countenance and support which thou alone canst give. Take them, therefore, Heavenly Father, under thy nurturing care. Give them wisdom in counsel and valor in the field. Defeat the malicious designs of our cruel adversaries. Convince them of the unrighteousness of their cause. And if they persist in their sanguinary purposes of owning unerring justice, sounding in their hearts, constrain them to drop the weapons of war from their unnerved hands in the day of battle. Be thou present, O God of wisdom, and direct the counsels of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle things on the best and surest foundation, that the scene of blood may be speedily closed in order that harmony and peace may be effectually restored, and truth and justice, religion and piety prevail and flourish among the people. Preserve the health of their bodies and vigor of their minds. Shower down on them and the millions they represent here such temporal blessings as thou seest expedient for them in this world, and crown them with everlasting glory in the world to come. For this we ask, in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. Would that this nation would feel that way again today. Well, today's scripture is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And I will forewarn you, I'm going to read an awful lot of scripture today, uh, but Hopefully, we will all gain something from it, so it, bear with me. I encourage you to follow along in your Bible. I will be reading from the New Living Translation, 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 18. Let us now hear the Word of God. There was a man named Elkanah who lived in Ramah in the region of Zuf in the hill country of Ephraim. He was the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, of Ephraim. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah did not. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Peninnah and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion, because the Lord had given her no children. So Peninnah would taunt Hannah and make fun of her, because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year it was the same. Peninnah would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle, each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. 
Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? Once after the sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord, and she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime, and as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger. But I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks and praise be to God. As I've said, I labeled today's message, You Want Me to Do What? Now in the story we just heard, Eli misjudged Hannah, judging her according to what he thought was going on. However, after her explanation, Eli blessed her and asked God to answer her prayer. And God did and gave the world the blessing of the prophet Samuel. There's a lesson for us to learn here. There are times when our perception of things may not be true. Would you pray with me? Father, as we consider your word today, we ask for your Spirit's guiding. We ask for your wisdom. We ask that you would anoint the words that I speak, that you would make them clear. And whatever you would have us understand, that we would take that understanding deep into our hearts that we might be better equipped to serve you and to share our faith with those who are new to the faith in, in Christ Jesus. For we know that only you know the plans you have for each of us, and they are good plans for our best, and they may go far beyond our expectations. We pray this through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. As I said, I'm going to share a lot of scripture today, and I'll do my best to share with you what the Spirit has laid on my heart concerning it. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 26, the Apostle tells us the story of the woman at the well. Hear now the Word of God. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them. His disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you are speaking to. You would ask me, and I would give you living water. But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. 
where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshiped? And Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in the spirit. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ, and when he comes he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. And they were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? And the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God, who sent me, and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to harvest. Many Samarians from the village believed in Jesus, because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. That was an amazing story, and we'll get into it in depth. But then in chapter 8, verses 2 through 11, John shares the story of the adulterous woman. The apostle writes, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. 
When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. These were all powerful words. And we just heard them at length. Two encounters that Jesus had with sinful women. Now there are a number of observations we can make of these two stories. Beyond the obvious one, Jesus interacted with women. The first encounter was initiated by Jesus himself, and the second was brought to Jesus by those looking to discredit him. Now a second observation we should be aware of, especially today as we observe what is going on in the world, not to mention in our country, is that there are opposing factions. Jesus, as Mary's son, is a Jew, and the first woman is a Samaritan. And though there had been much intermarrying, living in the very same area, both groups saw the other as an enemy. And if they could avoid crossing into each other's territory, they would. And this animosity remained even as both groups saw themselves as legitimate descendants of Abraham and deserving of God's promises, including a Messiah. Well, to get back to the first encounter, Jesus has been away teaching in Judea and is returning to Galilee, but is going through a Samaritan area and stops for some rest at a well dug by Jacob. Joseph's father. He there asks a woman coming to this well at midday, a time that would indicate she was not accepted by the community because women came to draw water either at dawn or dusk as they gathered to socialize. Therefore, it would be obvious to Jesus that she was shunned for some reason. But nonetheless, Jesus asks her for water. Now, she doesn't jump to it, even though it's a man asking, and in that society, that would have a lot of power. No, instead, she challenges Jesus, asking why is he asking her for water, pointing out that he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan, and their people don't even like each other, much less do anything for each other. She's not ready to do what Jesus has requested. She wants an explanation for why he would do this, putting aside the fact that as a woman, he shouldn't even be talking to her alone. Jesus explains to her that he is trying to give her a gift, and that his gift is far superior to the gift that he asks of her. We all heard how it went as I read the scripture. She is very hesitant. She listens to what he has to say. But here's the real curiosity. She wants the living water Jesus is offering but is still unsure of who is offering it. Who is this guy making such an amazing offer? I mean, he's being nice to me, but does he want something else from me? Now, what we know is she has the resources to give Jesus what he has asked for. She has a rope, she has a jug, so she can easily give him a drink of water. She has the ability to grant the request. This, however, is not what we need to see in all this. The woman is able to grant Jesus' a request, but she is still uncertain of why or who. The disciples, when they return, ask, why is he talking with a woman and a Samaritan at that? But they don't dare ask Jesus. And Jesus doesn't explain why he's talking to the woman. Instead, he gives the disciples another lesson as they ask for him to eat. And it's a lesson we all need. He shares the truth of what we all need, the bread of heaven, explaining that he is the bread of heaven sent from the Father, whose will he does. Just as he had explained to the woman that he is the living water, causing her to know enough to ask if he was the promised one, the Messiah, the disciples now are reminded of the same thing. 
The woman leaves, heading to town upon seeing the other Jews arrive, and we can only guess how uncomfortable that must have made her. But, and this is where it gets more interesting, she tells the townspeople of her encounter and brings them back with her to meet Jesus. She has told them all about this really interesting guy that she met, how he had told her every detail of her life, pointing out all her sins. Could it be that he is the expected Messiah? But we'll get back to that a little bit later, as there are some other things the Spirit has led me to. Jesus doesn't judge the woman, even though he's the only one who has the authority to do so. But he doesn't. He simply tells her he is the one that she needs, that he has what she needs. So let's notice, Jesus doesn't ask anything of her. He doesn't even ask her to repent. He just tells her he is all she needs. It's up to her to accept the living water, the gift being offered. And truly, isn't this what we hear all through the scripture? Don't judge, accept the gift, and share it. As we heard in today's scripture from 1 Samuel, we may not have all the facts, so how can we feel qualified to judge? And this brings me to the second encounter. Now, in this story, things are a bit different. As we heard, Jesus is not the initiator of the encounter. We find him doing what he always did teaching in the temple surrounded by many eager ears, when the religious leaders present him with a woman caught sinning. The woman is guilty. There is no question over her guilt. But that's not why they brought her. They really were not interested in honest judgment. If they were, don't you think they would have brought the adulterous man and some additional witnesses as well? No. What they wanted was for Jesus, as a man, the way they saw him, shouldn't she be stoned to death? You give us a judgment. But Jesus doesn't take the bait. He bends down and begins to write something in the sand. And we don't know what Jesus wrote. Many scholars have guessed. Everything from continuing with what he had been teaching uh, to writing do not judge others, and you will not be judged, but we simply do not know. But they keep pressuring Jesus to answer, and he agrees to answer, only if the one without sin among them agrees to throw the first stone. The one among them without sin. The implication being that they should be without sin before judging anyone else. Now, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 3, verse 10, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. Therefore, who are we, or they, to judge one another? And again, I'll reiterate, when we are judgmental, and we all are guilty of this, I, I know I am, there have been many times when I want someone judged, knowing full well my accusation is based on what I have accepted as the whole story, but I admit, as each of you should, we are too often ready to pass judgment on a fellow human based on what we assume to be true. Jesus says, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. That wouldn't be me or any one of you listening, or as a matter of fact, anyone alive. So we know from the story, no stone was thrown. They all left from the eldest on down, leaving Jesus to inquire of the woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to accuse you? Obviously, there is no one. They all left. Wouldn't we have? I know I would have. Jesus simply says, says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here again, as in the first story, Jesus does not require her to do anything. He doesn't require she join any group. He doesn't require her to do anything more than stop sinning. He doesn't even require her to acknowledge who he is. He wants her to go forward with a changed life. What a gracious Messiah. What a gracious and forgiving Savior. He requires nothing more than for us to stop sinning. 
And this is where we need to remember something important. We were given the law to help us understand that we can never be without sin. So we need something. Scripture tells us to support one another, whether it be through prayer, whether it be financially, or however, we are to support one another to facilitate our ability to grow in our faith and to share that growth with others and the truth of who Jesus is and what he offers. I believe this is exactly what Jesus was doing with these women. He wanted them to understand that they had been forgiven and they knew what their sins were. We know what our sins are. He was asking them to go and share what they know about him with everyone they met. Jesus was asking them to be his witnesses. And truly, is this not what Jesus asks of all of those who claim his name? So how do we do this? What are you asking me to do? Well, it's done by sharing the truth as we understand it, doing our best not to sin as we are sharing this truth, doing our best to support one another as we do, helping each other to make this rough road we're on a little smoother. Now, in these stories, Jesus has had an encounter with two women, both of them clearly guilty of sin. And he has told them both the very same thing. And it is the same truth he tells each and every one of us. Go, be my witnesses, share the truth that you know. Here's where I am with all this today. As I've shared earlier, this may be what I needed to remember, what I needed to help me grow in my faith walk. But my hope is that what the Spirit has put on my heart is going to be a blessing to everyone listening. It is the simple gospel. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me, and have eternal life. Live your life in ways that bring honor to God, knowing that the first commandment is to acknowledge God before anything else. God is to come before anything else. And Jesus gave a second commandment and said it is equally as important as the first. He told us to love our neighbor as ourselves. In other words, love each other. Love each other. Jesus is not asking us to do anything other than that, to love one another. He's asking us, as his followers, to show his love to everyone. The woman at the well, nor the, the adulterous woman, had any expectation to be forgiven, and yet Jesus freely forgave them. He freely for, forgives us. He didn't judge them. He doesn't want to judge us. He simply forgave them, and he forgives us. And that's why he went to the cross, to do that for us. I'd like to share one last scripture before I close. John 12, verses 47 and 48, and remind us all that this is Jesus speaking, and it's kind of a warning. If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't accept my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Acts 16, 31. Amen and amen. Let us hear this benediction from Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you for joining me today, and if you need prayer or just someone to talk to, you can send me your contact information by messaging me on my Facebook page, and I promise I will get back to you in a timely manner. And may your week be filled to overflowing with the love of Christ, and may you dance before him until we meet again, whether here 